tell you about um, hopefully will encourage you. It has, it has me. Um, this past week, uh, me and my mom and dad, uh, who are 79 and 80, um, went to uh, Cherokee. It was uh, kind of on my bucket list to um, go to Clingman's Dome. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. It was my first time. And uh, I watched the video of it, and I thought, well, I think I can do that. It's, uh, it's a, a paved path all the way up, and it's only a half a mile long. And I thought, okay, I, I think I can do that. And my dad, being the soldier that he is, um, said, you know, I'll, I'll go with you. Uh, I don't think it was on his bucket list. I think at his age, he's just glad he's got a bucket. <laughs> but uh, anyway, my mom wasn't able to make it up there. She stayed down at the bottom. She said, she, she just didn't think she was strong enough to do it. So I thought, well, they've got benches along the way, and uh, I think I can handle that. So we started out, barely made it to the first bench. And uh, I can definitely tell you I'm very familiar with every rock and every tree all the way up there. A half a mile doesn't seem like long until you're, uh, until you're making that trip. And um, it, it was uh, definitely a challenge. But... Um, Anyway, all the way up, I was thinking, Lord, I don't know if I, I'm going to make it. Um, it's 6,600, I think, and 43 miles above sea level. So the air was getting very thin. My dad, back in the first part of the year, we thought we were going to lose him because he'd got pneumonia and he had developed some other problems. And so it was really a feat for him, too. But, and I think at any, any moment, he probably would have been really willing to turn around. But it was just something that, that was in me that I felt like I, there was a strong desire to do. And I was thinking, okay, when I get to the top, I've heard that, um, you know, when you, you're so high up, when you look off, if, if, the, if it's clear, you're not, most of the time you're in the clouds, but if it's clear, you can see for 100 miles in every direction. I thought, oh, what a wonderful sight to see all that. Well, it wasn't in the cards for me to see that, and which is okay, but I think God had another purpose in, in uh, letting me go through that trial, because it definitely was a trial, um, but all the way up, the whole way up, there was, there was people from all walks of life, a lot of, some of them even probably not from this country, but every, the whole way up, there was encouraging words, you can make it, you're halfway there, just a little farther to go, and I thought, you know, after, after we got back, Dad and I both exclaimed, you know, we just really talked most, mostly about how encouraging the people were. They had no idea who we were. What they saw was that we were struggling, that we had a purpose, and, and they encouraged us all the way up. Didn't know anything about us. There was some that, that was there, that, some even walking with canes to get up there, but yet they, they found it in their heart to encourage us. And then uh, all the way up and all the way down, so all the way down, we were able to give that same encouragement to others. And uh, it's just, it was just amazing at how God used that, you know. Um, I, and I, I really believe with all my heart that he didn't open up the clouds when we got up there because he didn't, he didn't want my focus to be on that. Yes, that would, that would have been amazing. But I think he wanted me to focus more on two things. One is encouraging others because life is hard. It's hard for us all. And um, if we're there as, as somebody else's cheerleader, it, it makes the, the um, path less rocky. Maybe your, your focus is not so much on the rockiness. It's on, it's on the, the climb. It's on the climb. It's all a climb. But, uh, and then the other thing is, is as many people as there was, you know, he died for those people too, and he loves them. And, and he wants us to focus on, on others, not on ourselves, and um, and that's what they were doing for us, and that's what we tried to do on the way down. But it was just amazing. Um, do I want to do it again? Hopefully. Uh, can I do it again? I don't know. It was very hard. Trust me, it was very hard. But I am thankful that we made it there and back, and and really had a good time. And you know, I want I want God to use that in my life when when life gets hard for me or others to um, to remember that, to remember that climb and remember that encouraging, the, those encouraging words and try to use that to encourage others and not focus so much on 
what I'm going through. And that takes, that, that narrows your vision where you're not just overwhelmed by life. But um, anyway, I'm just thankful, thankful to be back, thankful to be breathing. about to die but tarried he still on behind so they laid Lazarus in a tomb and they said their last goodbye and coming down the road was Jesus right on time just hold on far away and he knows your need before you pray so when your feet are weary from the mountain you have climbed look ahead here comes Jesus right on Deserts. They were so hot and dry Till it seemed all hope was gone And I would die Then I wondered where was he Is he still a friend of mine Then coming down the road was Jesus Right on time not too far away and he knows your need before you pray so when your feet are weary from the mountain you have climbed look ahead here comes Jesus right on time so From the mountain you have climbed, look ahead, here comes Jesus right on time. Thank you so much for that. Aren't you glad he's on time this morning? I think I was talking with Dave. Yesterday morning we were going to meet, cook breakfast for the men, and uh, I told him we'd meet at 7 o'clock, and uh, I think me and him both got there at 6.45. Uh, he was pulling up as I was walking down, and uh, we were discussing being on time. And Dad had a saying, said, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late, and late is unacceptable. So, uh, uh I'm thankful today God's on time, even though we are not most of the time. Amen. <laughs> All right. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to Matthew chapter number 15. Matthew chapter number 15. And we will uh, pick up in the message where we left off last week. We finished chapter 14. And if you remember, Jesus had just gotten through doing uh, some miracles. He had fed the 5,000 and uh, had, had preached a message to the, 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 all the ones that were gathered there, had saved the disciples out on the sea, and, and, and just done amazing things in chapter 14. And who have we figured out follows Jesus around about all the time besides the crowd and the disciples? The scribes and the Pharisees, right? And so they have still not left him alone. And if you've been coming to any of the services on Wednesday night, we've been doing a study through the book of Acts, uh, even after Jesus was crucified, resurrected, and ascended, 
and the New Testament church began to be developed through the book of Acts, the scribes and the Pharisees never quit on their job. They followed those, uh, Paul and, and Peter and all of them, they stayed after them too. So uh, I'm determined today that probably uh, I have some scribes and Pharisees chasing me too. Now they ain't called that, but how many of us know we've got critics just about everywhere, amen? And uh, uh, I usually will take about a half a baby aspirin every night worried about my critics. So uh, that tells you how big of a deal it is, all right? If you're in Matthew chapter number 15, uh, if you will, stand to your feet this morning if you're able for the reading of God's Word, all right? The Bible says in verse 1, then came, Je then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem. They came a long way to do their job, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandments of God by your traditions? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the dead what God said. But ye say, whosoever shall say to your father or his mother, it is a gift. But whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And I'll explain that here just a little bit. And honor not his father and his mother, shall he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy you, saying, the people draweth nigh to me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men, and, the, and call the multitude and said unto them, I'm sorry, but in vain ye do worship me, teaching the doctrines and the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth unto the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the man, this defileth a man. Remember, he's speaking in a parable so that they won't understand. Then came the disciples and said unto him, This is funny to me, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended? <laughs> I think Jesus probably took a half a baby aspirin word about that. After they heard this saying, but he answered and said, Every plant which thy, my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare to, to us this parable. And Jesus said, Are ye also without understanding? Do ye not understand that whatsoever entereth into the mouth goeth into the belly? and is cast out through the draw. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulterers, fornication, theft, false witness, and blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Brother Harrison, if you will, pray for us this morning. Amen, you may be seated. What's the title of the message this morning? Am I a hypocrite? If you have witnessed very often or invited people to church, uh, how many of you have got the responses, uh, well, I, I really don't want to go to church because they're just a bunch of what? Hypocrites. 
People tell me that. I've been told that numerous times, and my response has always been, you'll go to Waffle, uh, to Waffle House, Walmart, Golden Corral with them. Why won't you go to church with them? They'll go everywhere else with a bunch of hypocrites because the truth of the matter is we all are hypocrites at some point in time in our life. Uh, and people use that as an excuse not to go to church. We won't get into all of that. But what's the definition of a hypocrite? One who faints to be what he is not. One who has the form of godliness without the power. Or one who assumes an appearance of piety and virtue when he is destitute of true religion. A hypocrite. In other words, we will put on airs on the outside but what's on the inside is messed up. Y'all realize why I'm dressed the way I am this morning? And I'm overdressed, by the way. I tried to dress for the condition of my heart. You see, a lot of us will put on our Sunday best and go to church and act our Sunday best when the reality is we've got issues in our heart. Trust me. You remember a couple weeks ago I said I'm preaching to myself. Y'all just sit here and enjoy it. It's another one of those, and I ain't liking it at all. Because, <laughs> it, 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 like I said earlier, when you preach them verse by verse, chapter by chapter, it's hard to dodge. So we got to deal with what we got to deal with. Jesus is speaking and teaching, doing the work that God had called him to do, and the scribes and the Pharisees are on the sidelines and said, hey, they didn't wash their hands before they ate. Why, they profaned the traditions. On traditions. I'm tired of traditions. Unless they were in the scriptures. Jesus has to teach a lesson to them. And that we would easily stand on the side and say, Yeah, tell it to a preacher. I read this and boy, it hit me hard. And this is a commentary, so it is a man's opinion, but it touched me. One of God's supreme commands is that you should not take the Lord God's name in vain. There's probably not very many things that make me madder than somebody cussing taking God's name in vain. Can I get a witness? That command obviously prevents profanity or vulgarity in which God's name is used. More than those obvious things, it also forbids flippant, irreverent use of his name. When somebody says the big man upstairs, that almost makes me just as mad. Not the big guy in the sky either. He's to be talked about reverently. But more than those obvious things, it also forbids any use of God's name in its superficial, indifferent, insincere, or hypocritical. It has been said that God's name is taken in vain more often in the house of God than anywhere else. His name is taken in, in vain when His name is methodically used in irreverent prayers and it's singing of His praises while having no thought of Him. And we'll pray thoughtlessly to Him without genuine devotion. His name is taken in vain through empty worship perhaps more than any other way. Hypocritical worship was among the worst offenses by ancient Israel and is said by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 1. He said, talking about God, bring, us, bring, said, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moon and the Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assemblies. I hate your new moon and festivals and your appointed feasts that have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. 
So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Uh, yes, even though your multiplied prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. God was speaking to the nation of Israel. And he basically said this. You play in church. All across this country today, there are pastors that will stand in the pulpit today. They'll preach their sermonette to a bunch of Christianettes. And I won't finish the rest of it because y'all probably heard that one before. Brother Bill's grinning like a father. You probably heard that a few times, ain't you? We, we come in and we, and you, you're hearing me right, we are playing church most of the time. And we'll get mad when somebody cusses and uses God's name in vain, but we'll sing, oh, how I love Jesus, and be wondering, oh, Lordy, I had to go here. We'll be wondering about how the ball game went yesterday and what we're going to do this week to correct all the problems. Oh, how I love Jesus. Did I tell you I was preaching to me today? Do we take what we're doing serious? If we took our job as serious as we do our worship, how long would we be employed? Yeah, me too. You see, the scribes, they wrote scriptures. The deal was that they didn't have, obviously, printing presses and things of that nature, so the scribes would memorize scriptures. Especially when they went into captivity, men would sneak aside and they would begin to write the scriptures as they knew them. And in the process of writing the, the scriptures, they would add their ideas to it. And before long, over the time, years of time, God gave them Ten Commandments. But how many of you know when they got done, they added over 600 more commandments to it. And they would take a commandment say, okay, honor thy father and thy mother, and here's the best way to do that. And they would add and add and add and add. And a lot of times it would get to the point where it would, uh, the addings gave them ways out of following the actual commandments. And that we still do that to this day. You remember one of the comedians said you might be a redneck if. Well, today we're going to do that a little different. You might be a hypocrite if. Let's look at some characteristics of a hypocrite. And I promise you I'm not going to leave you bleeding today, okay? We're going to get some salve on the wounds and we're going to get this thing fixed. But what are some characteristics of a hypocrite. A hypocrite always looking to point out faults in others. When their faults are revealed, they yeah, but, but what about so and so? Boy, how many times have we seen that? How many times have we done that? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 through 5. And notice the verse. And why beholdest, that means to look upon. Thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye. That's pointing it out. Look, he's got something in his eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold a beam that is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite first, cast out the beam of thine own eye. That takes action. Then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. That is action. We're a whole lot more apt to point out problems than to take care of our own and then go help them take care of theirs. A hypocrite today will usually point out the faults in others while dealing theirs is huge. A hypocrite is more concerned with outside ritual than inside purity. Verse 5, But we say, but ye say, whosoever shall say to his father and his mother, it is a gift, but whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. 
You see, the commandment was, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be what? Long. Well, the, 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 the scribes and the Pharisees wrote in this little, little disclaimer there that if you had a, a financial increase or something and, it was, and you were led to honor thy mother and thy father, in other words, take care of them, but you really didn't want to spend the money on them, you wanted to keep it for yourself, you could say, well, this money is a gift to God. But you got to hold it and use it until you died. You see how they would write around it? Today we have laws of the land and then the politician write laws to circumvent the laws so they know how to get around it, but they'll hold you accountable for it. We're still doing those kind of things today, even in our own government, but we'll do it in our own life too. We'll read God's Word and say, yeah, but I think it says this. When somebody starts giving me an opinion about what God's Word is, I automatically step, take a step back and wonder and read what is the context, what is God's Word really saying. Brother Brown taught us, he said, there's only one interpretation of God's Word, and that's exactly what God meant when He said it. Do we understand today God wrote down what He said, He gave it to the ones that He had writing God's Word, and what He said He meant, and what He meant, he said, there's no writing rules around it. Man is more concerned with outside ritual than with inside purity. Ritual requires no change of heart, no forsaking of sin, no repentance before God. It allows a person to display symbols of religion while beholding to his sin. It is religion, the form rather than faith, and therefore empty and hypocritical. Matthew chapter 23, verse 25. The Bible says, Woe to the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Though blind Pharisees cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that to the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto white sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead man's bones, of all uncleanliness. Verse 28, Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, Having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, Turn away. I submit to you this morning that it's all about the heart. How many of you this morning when you saw me dressed like I was, and y'all been around me long enough to know you liable to see anything, and I get that, but you're probably going, oh man, why is he dressed like that? My wife got on to me for being dressed like this this morning. I said, there's a point to it. <sighs> what was she looking at? What I had on the outside. What was God looking at? How's your heart this morning, Chris? I told some of you, you may not remember the message, but you'll remember the, the illustration, I hope. And by the way, on the back of your bulletin, there's places to write notes. I, I highly recommend it. All right, write notes. Something hits you, write it down. You want me to want to see it? Take, tuck in your Bible, take it home, read it this week. What was their heart like when we came in this morning? Some of you came in this morning. Y'all look pretty, look wonderful. Mostly the women. Us fellas, we ain't got much to work with, so we we just here, okay. But what is our heart like? Hypocrites are more concerned with the outside ritual than the inside purity. Thirdly, we get offended when presented with the truth. Mm. How are you feeling about me right now? <laughs> That'll tell you whether or not you're a hypocrite or not. We get offended with the pre presentation of the truth. Verse 12, Then his disciples said unto him, Knowest thou 
that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? The disciples are actually worried about them. These people have been critics of theirs from day one and will be till the end of time. Don't worry about it. The Bible says in Psalms 119, 165, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Are you easily offended this morning? Especially when somebody points out your shortcomings? I'll be honest with you, I don't like to be told I'm wrong. Anybody else like that? It, it, it bothers me. The older I get, the more I'm learning. It, I may not like it, but if I'll take a step back or two and go, okay, are they right? And it's hard to do. Can I get a witness? It's tough. I know it is. There's an old saying, if the shoe fits, wear it. Lastly, they're destined for destruction. Look at verse 13 and 14. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted. In other words, if they're in the, if they're in the field, but they're not of God, they're going to get burned up. Shall be rooted up, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall in to the ditch. Here's something I've learning, and it's hard to do sometimes. When you run up on those kind of people, and I hope for us, and I'm trying to be pliable and flexible and teachable and trainable and uh, used of God, in order for me to do that, i got to be willing to take the truth in and learn from it and grow from it. But those that won't, just leave them alone. Let God take care of them because they're destined for destruction. I had a uh, texting conversation this week with someone that has an idea in their mind that something is right and no amount of Bible, and I give them plenty of Bible that, that, that says that it ain't, and they threw back into my face, well, uh, gluttony's a sin too. I said, yeah, it is. Sure is. But every verse they gave you about gluttony also mentioned drunkenness and they still could see it. I had two responses to them and I backed off. Why? Can't change your mind. A mind changed against its will is of the same opinion still. You want to write that down? Get with me after church and I'll tell it to you again, all right? Just back off. They're going to have learned the hard way. How many of you know it's hard learning the hard way? The things that cost you the most or hurt you the most are the lessons you learn the best. They're bound for destruction now. How many of you need the emergency room right now? You need God's emergency room. <laughs> How do we fix this problem? I'm glad you asked. First of all, we understand clearly. Understand clearly. In verse 18, he said, but those things which proceed out of thy mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulterers, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. In other words, in the heart is where murder begins. I ain't going to ask for a show of hands, but I hope nobody in here has ever murdered anybody. Please tell me no. How many of you have been mad enough to do it? Yeah, in Jesus' name, I want to lay hands. We wouldn't commit adultery, but in our heart. Fornication, no, but in our heart. Theft, false witness. All of these things are matters of the heart. And here, and if you're writing, please write this down. You cannot fix the spiritual with the physical. You cannot fix the spiritual with the physical. I, I can name names right now. 
of people that if you looked at their outward life, they were living at the foot of the cross. One fellow I have in mind right now was uh, leading music before an, an awesome choir, singing in a great quartet the whole time he was having not just one affair, but two affairs on his wife. He had him a whole string of girlfriends and was teaching Sunday school to boot for years. Wore the finest suit there is. He looked good on the outside, but whew, he was a mess on the inside. See, you can't put on enough ties. You can't put on enough pieces of a suit. You can't put on the shiny shoes I got at the stove to fix what's on the inside. So we have to understand clearly, it is a spiritual thing. We understand clearly and examine closely. My mother, this week, short story, got out of the house Tuesday night. We, we still do not know what happened. Went down the driveway at some point, fell, wound up in a ditch by the driveway, and to our knowledge, stayed there all night long. Uh, we got the caretaker found her the next morning. We got her rushed to the hospital, and they looked her over, and she looked normal on the outside. She was a little pale from being out in the weather all night, but they began to do examinations. They checked her blood. They checked her urine. Then they took x-rays and CT scans. What do all of those things do? They examine what's on the inside. We want to examine closely. The Bible says in Psalms 139, verse 23, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Now, if you pray that prayer, be ready. Because what you ask, He will do. In verse 24, And see if there be any way, wicked way in me, and lead me, in the way of everlasting. Aren't you glad that the verse ends with lead me in the way everlasting? He'll show you and help you get through what your issue is. How do we examine? Well, first of all, we examine our speech. We examine our speech. Luke chapter 6 verse 45 says, A good man out of the treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil, for out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth, what? Speaketh. You can't have a potty mouth Monday through Saturday come into church on Sunday and worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. I ain't been with nobody through the week that's cussing, okay? If you got caught with that one, that's on you. That's the Lord speaking to you. And I don't know about you, and I'll just be honest. They sometimes I have to bite my tongue. Oh, I got some amens there. Hallelujah. I ain't alone. I work in carpentry. How many of you ever hit your thumb with a hammer? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Is that what you say? Mm. I've never had to bite my tongue to keep from saying, Praise the Lord. <laughs> What is your speech like? I could be around a person and talk to them in conversation for a little while and usually I can tell if they're a Christian or not or at least if they are a good one. I worked in uh, the PN department synthetic when I first went out there. The second best cusser in the group because one of them, he was rough. He's the one who cussed me out for being a preacher. But the second one was a deacon at a local church. Son, he could let it roll. I learned words from him. I didn't know he was a deacon for a long time. And it come out. It's been the last thing I would have thought. Examine your speaking. Examine your spending. Matthew chapter 6 verse 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you were to do it, and I wouldn't, you know, I don't want you to do it. But if you were to lay out your bank statements, I can tell you what you treasure the most.
where you spend the most money, that's where you, your heart is. Apparently mine's at the grocery store. <laughs> Nowadays you can't hardly help but spend a lot there, amen? But my desire is to give unto the Lord as much as I possibly can. And I, I've instructed Brother Bill never to tell me who tithes and who does not. But as your pastor, and I feel like you deserve uh, that opportunity, if you ever want to know what I give, you can ask him and he can tell you. Because my heart is in this church. And because that's where it's at, a lot of my money is in this church. I don't begrudge a nickel of it. I, it's the best investment I've got. I mean, God says open up windows of heaven and he'll pour it out. You can't even, he said, you take your basket, catch it all, shake it, press it down. He said, it'll still run over. I just, I trust God's economy way better than I trust the United States economy. And it don't take a rocket science to figure that one out. Where's your money going? Examine your speaking, examine your spending, and then lastly, examine your service. Where do you spend your time? This is going to shock some of y'all. But do you realize there's people that they do a checklist on Sunday morning, maybe on Wednesday nights, when it comes to church, and they go, okay, if I got anything else I could do. Well, what about this? What about this? Well, I guess we'll go to church. See, shocked some of you. I heard you. Somebody, Some people are really that way. I look forward to Sunday mornings. I look forward to Wednesday nights. I get to be with y'all. I get to worship my Lord and Savior. I get to share God's Word. I get help from God's Word. Examine your service. Where do you want to be? What do you want to be doing? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Doesn't matter how they treat you. And that's a hard one to swallow. Just be a Christian on the job no matter what. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With the good will, doing service as to the Lord, not unto men, or not to men. Examine your service. What are you doing what you're doing for? Does that make sense? Why are you doing what you do? If I am a, and I am a realtor, I should be a Christian realtor, not a realtor that happens to be a Christian. In any kind of business dealing I have, I should be wanting to promote the name of Christ first and foremost in my dealings. I, that does not mean I have to preach to everybody I come in contact with, but when they walk away from the deal, they ought to know they were treated fairly by a child of the king. You examine somebody's speech, their spending, and how they live their life. You'll know whether or not they're a hypocrite or a Christian. Then lastly, this is so important, guard cautiously. Guard cautiously. How do we fix our life? How do we become more and more like Christ? The Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. I've said this before and I'll say it again. You, you don't go through life without being intentional for the cause of Christ. You have to do it on purpose. And that's hard to do. I ain't going to lie to you. We, we've been trying to do the, the uh, go and sow and share our story and all those types of things. And, and every time I have given my story, you know what I had to do? I had to purpose in my heart, I'm going to do it. 
And there's several times that I tried to talk me out of it. You ever had that conversation before? Talking to yourself? Sometimes you have to to have an intelligent conversation, right? I have all, I've tried to talk myself out of almost every time I've shared my story. You have to be diligent in what God's called us to do. You know how I will be able to put back on a suit and tie next week if I'm diligent this week in not being a hypocrite. If I just kick back and kick it out of gear and let it roll, I'll be a hypocrite because that's my nature. I've used this illustration before, but it goes well here, and it's been a long time. And by the way we've adjusted the last few weeks, y'all don't remember from one week to the next what <laughs> illustrations I use. But growing up, I, I, we had a long chicken house. I think it's like 300 foot long. It's a big old long thing. And I had, we had a tractor, and we put out round bales. And I would take the tractor, load up a round bale, go out the end of the barn, go all the way down the side to put the hay out. And invariably, especially when it rained, I built ruts down the side of the barn. In the wintertime, when it would freeze up, and I'm about 12 years old, so it don't take much to excite me, I would pull around the barn, and I would take my hands off the wheel, and woo, because I was in the ruts. And I knew as long as I stayed in the ruts, I could take my hands off, I'd kick back, I could relax, and that tractor just go where it goes. But if there was ever a time I needed to make a change in the direction I was going, I had to grab hold of the wheel, pull it out of the rut. I learned this week in studying, if I'm not going to be a hypocrite, i got to grab hold of the wheel, pull my life out of a rut, and be a real Christian, God could say, well done, thy faithful servant. How about you today? If we dressed on the outside like we were on the inside, what would we be wearing today? Every head bowed, every eye closed.